G'day guys, the Netrunner car game is about to get a reprint, but I was able to find very few videos about it um, anywhere, especially any videos about how to actually play the game. So I thought I'd put this video together to try and explain how to play Netrunner. Now I put this video together very quickly, so um, apologies if there are any jerky moments whenever I am. Um... Netrunner is a two player and only two player asymmetrical card game. Asymmetrical means that the two decks that are used are completely unique. You can't move one card out of one deck and put it into the other one. One player, in this case, plays the purple corporate deck, and the other player plays the green runner deck. So, one player plays the role of an evil corporation, or at least a corporation of some description, trying to advance slightly dodgy agendas. And the other player plays the role of the netrunner, or what you might otherwise call the hacker, who's trying to hack into the corporation's servers and get access to the agendas. And as it's bloody difficult to explain one without explaining the other, I'm going to have to explain the rules for both of them at the same time. But I will have the corporate deck on my side of the table for most of the, the demonstration game. Both players start off the game by shuffling their respective decks and then drawing five cards. Five cards also happens to be the maximum hand size which you have to discard down to at the end of every one of your turns. Players also take five bits which are here represented as energy cubes stolen from the other Richard Garfield game, King of Tokyo. Bits are the currency for the game and you can use one action during one of your turns to take a bit. You can also use one action to draw a card. That's two actions that are common to both sides of the table. The corporation player must draw a card at the beginning of their turn and they then get three actions. After those three actions are over, the runner will then get four actions and they don't have to draw a card at the beginning of their turn. One of the interesting things about Netrunner is that almost all of the cards that are played by the corporation player at least start off as hidden information, as face down cards, whereas almost everything played by the runner is face up information. This means that the corporation is really more in the bluffing position. And bluffing plays an important part in uh, many parts of the game. So Netrunner is all about agendas. And whether you're the corporation or the runner, this is how you score points in this game. And the first person to score seven points from agendas is the winner. And that's the main way of winning the game. The number of points you get from scoring agenda is, uh, an agenda is down the bottom. In this case, for corporate downsizing, it's two. Um, from a flavour perspective, uh, the corporation scoring this card would mean that they have advanced this agenda, that this agenda has, has happened. From the runner's perspective, they are merely stealing the information which they then sell on the black market or something like that. The runner doesn't need to advance the agenda. In terms of how difficult it is to get this agenda advanced, that's up in the top right corner. In this case, a cost of three to advance the corporate downsizing agenda. If the corporation has this card in their hand, they can start the process of advancing and scoring the agenda by taking an action to install it in a remote server like that. The remote server is called a subsidiary data fort in the um, old version of Netrunner, which is the cards that I'm playing with here. Um, there are also three main servers, or main data forts, which are sort of semi-described here. Let me just put a card down here to show you. The, your deck is in a server, your hand is in a server, which here is represented just basically by the line that the credits or the bits are on, and also there's your discard pile, which is also in a server. This is important because one of the actions that the runner can take, and one of the most important actions in the whole game of Netrunner, is making a run. For one action, the runner chooses one of your servers to make a run on. If, in this case, there is nothing protecting any of your servers, then a run is automatically successful. And depending on which, run, uh, which server you've made a run on, different things happen. Let's say that this is the end of my first turn, and then the runner starts their turn, and they decide to make a run on this server, which at the moment is just this card they would immediately be successful in that run, which means that they would be able to look at this card. The runner looks at the card, and if it's an agenda, then they immediately score that agenda and put it to one side. And in this case, the runner has already scored two points towards the seven points that they need to win the game. Sounds easy, doesn't it? 
Well, in fact, it's even easier than that because the runner can also make runs on these three servers. The runner, your deck is completely fair game for the runner to go for. And if in this case the runner was, was to make a run on this deck, which is currently unprotected, they would get to look at the top card of the deck. In this case, it's not an agenda, so they put that back. You also can't hide agendas in your hand, because your hand is also fair game for the runner to make a run on. If they make a run on this starter fort, which some people sometimes represent with a card, and it's not protected, then they'll get to look at a random card from your hand. And if that random card happens to be an agenda, then they score that straight away as well. In this case, there isn't one, and I'm going to explain some of these other cards in a minute. Finally, they can also make a run on your discard pile. Or, and if there's anything in your discard pile, so they get to look through the entire thing, if there's anything here which is an agenda, then they also score it. Keeping in mind, there are also some cards which have a trash cost on them. You can see in the bottom right there's a trash icon with a number on it. If the runner sees one of these cards in either the archives or R&D, which is the deck, or HQ, which is your hand, then they can pay that number of bits in order to send that card to the trash. In this case, this node was looked at um, in the trash and it's already there, so seeing that in the trash wouldn't actually do anything. It's probably a bad example. Anyway, let's pretend I didn't do that. Let's go back a step to the point where the corporation installed this agenda. Now, one of the other actions that they can take is that they can spend a bit or a credit to advance this agenda one step. Now what I tend to do is use that bit to put onto the agenda to represent that that, um, uh, so that agenda has advanced one step. Some people use some other tokens and there will probably be some new types of tokens available when the reprinter of Netrunner comes out. The corporation can advance an agenda as many times as they have the bits and the actions to perform. So let's say that this card was out at the beginning of my turn. I've got three actions, and I could actually just go advance agenda, advance agenda, advance agenda. Now the corporation can look at their hidden cards at any time, and in this case, once the third advancement token has been put on this agenda, we can see that the difficulty of three has been achieved, which means that the corporation will get to score this agenda. In addition to the two points gained towards the seven that the corporation needs to win the game, the text written on the card is undertaken as well. This only applies to when the corporation scores the agenda and isn't relevant to when the runner scores it. I'm not going to explain what this card does or what any of the other agendas do because they're all different and they're all fairly self-explanatory. So let's just put this to the side and assume that this was a scored agenda. Now, agendas aren't the only things that corporations can put into new servers. There's also another type of card called the node. An interesting thing about the node is it doesn't actually give you agenda points. It's sort of a decoy in some ways, but they can provide you with other benefits. A node, if you've got it in your hand, is played and installed in exactly the same way as an agenda. Just like that. Now, the node doesn't actually do anything whilst it's face down. What needs to happen is that the corporation needs to pay enough bits based on the cost up in the top right corner in order to res it. Now, res it is sort of like starting a program, initializing a program. It's sort of the cost needed to get this thing up and running, and it applies to a couple other types of cards in the game as well. I'm pretty sure, and I'll check this and might have to update the video, you can res a node at any time that you want. In this case, the corporation can pay one bit from their bit pool and flip over the node so that it's upright and then whatever is written on the card becomes inoperational and in effect in the game. At this case, at the start of each run, the runner must pay one bit in addition to any other costs or they have to end the run. So this is going to make running more expensive for the runner. You can think of nodes as other activities that the corporation are undertaking that aren't of as much interest to the runner. But, like I said before, there is still a trash cost on these cards. So if the runner was to make a run on this server, whether or not the card is exposed or not, when the runner gets to this card, they can trash it for the trash cost. Um, 
quite often nodes provide you with uh, extra bits or credits, extra ways of, uh, of gaining those, or they can also be uh, booby traps or setups so that when the runner accesses them, something crappy happens to the runner. Let's put this uh, node uh, back away in the, uh, in the trash and put this agenda back in as it was installed without any advancement tokens on it. I want to talk about the way that you can actually protect this card from being um, attacked by the runner and actually the way you can protect your deck, your R&D, or your hand, your HQ, or your archives as well. It's called ICE. ICE stands for Intrusion Countermeasure Electronics, but might otherwise be known in the modern world as a firewall. Um, they come in uh, three different forms, ICE walls, ICE sentries, and ICE code gates. This one, the data wall, is an ICE wall, and it has one what's called subroutine. I'm going to go back a step and talk about how you install these. So let's say we had this data wall in our hand. For an action, the ICE can be installed in front of one of the servers. So this is installed in front of our agenda, and it's effectively, potentially, going to be protecting that agenda from being taken. We could also, if we wanted to protect our hand, put it there, protect our deck, or protect our discard pile, our archives. Now, chances are you're not going to have enough ice to be able to protect all of these, and in the early game, quite often, if you've got agendas in your hand, you want to be protecting your hand. And then, quite often, your deck will be exposed, so the runner will make runs onto the top of your deck, and just hope that they top deck an agenda, which is quite difficult to, uh, to avoid in the early game. This ice sits here as a potential deterrent to the runner. Now, when the runner announces that they want to make a run on a particular server, they will say, right, they're going to make a run on this server. And the first thing that happens is that they encounter the uppermost piece of ice, keeping in mind that there might be multiple layers of ice that are installed uh, to protect this server. But let's just start off with uh, the one piece of ice at the moment. The runner comes up to this piece of ice and then it is the choice of the uh, corporation as to whether or not to res it, to whether or not to install this piece of ice and actually have it operational protecting the agenda or node that it's um, in front of. So let's have a look at the two numbers that are on this uh, data wall. Up in the top right is the res cost and down in the bottom left is the strength of this wall. Now uh, keeping in mind that ice can only be rezzed under normal circumstances as the runner is approaching it. That's the only time you get a choice to flip these around from face down to face up and actually being operational in the uh, objective of protecting whatever it's in front of. So the cost is only one bit and we know that this is an agenda so chances are we do want to protect it. So we're going to pay one bit in order to have that ice exposed, have that ice rezzed, and now that that ice is um, rezzed, whatever subroutines there are written on this card are uh, executed. Now there can be multiple little arrows on this card which mean that multiple things happen. This one is the most probably sim simple ice you can get, which is simply one subroutine which, if it isn't broken by the runner, will end their run and stop them from going any further. The runner can break these subroutines and stop them from happening by using what's called an icebreaker. In this case, the icebreaker would have to be able to break walls. If they did have an icebreaker, and I'll explain those in a moment, they would be able to prevent this subroutine from happening and they would continue on their journey towards the agenda. If this was the final piece of ice, like it is here in this example, then this agenda would become revealed. Or should I say this card? I knew, the corporation knew it was an agenda. It might have been a node. The card gets exposed regardless of what it is. The runner has a look at it, scores it if it's an agenda, and if it's a node, then the corporation has a choice to res it and then have it, ha have it do whatever it does. If the card here has a trash cost, then the runner can pay the trash cost after that to get rid of this card and, and force the um, corporation to discard it. Let's say I'm really keen on this agenda, or at least I want to provide the illusion of being keen on this agenda. I might want to protect this card with more than one uh, piece of ice. So, If I want to do that, 
I find another ice card that's in my hand and then I have to pay an additional bit for every card beyond the first that I am in the stack. So in this case I'm paying one bit in order to put uh, an ice in front of the existing one. You can only put ice in front of other ice, but there is no limit to the number of ones that you can stack up, but normally you're getting a maximum of three. Um, four is pretty ridiculous, because keeping in mind, you're not just wanting to protect this card, but you might have two or three other servers with other cards or um, with other cards in them. You've got to protect your hand and your deck, and you discard pile if you end up discarding any agendas. So let's have a look at the um, card that I've just uh, installed here. This is called Canis Major. Uh, it's an ice sentry, also a watchdog, which is sometimes important for particular cards. But generally, that third attribute is, uh, is not important, especially for not for this video demo. So the one subroutine that runs uh, on this, if the uh, ice is exposed and the runner makes a run on that server, is for the remainder of the run, all further ice is encountered at plus two strength. So let's simulate a... Um, another run. So let's say that the runner wants to make a run on, uh, on this server and neither of these two pieces of ice are exposed. The runner encounters the first piece of ice and the corporation can have a look at it and then make a decision about whether or not they want to res it. We see in this case that there's a um, a res cost of uh, zero for this ice so there's a pretty good chance that um, the corporation is, is going to res this. So they do so, it's flipped over, and unless the runner has an icebreaker that can achieve a strength of four to break this sentry subroutine, then this sentry subroutine is going to run. But keep in mind that this sentry subroutine doesn't actually say that the run is ended. So let's say that the runner didn't have the ability to break that subroutine. The run would continue to this point, at which point the runner has the choice of jacking out before they see the new piece of ice. Let's say that they're brave and they want to continue. The corporation then has the decision of raising this next piece of ice. Let's say they decide to do so. It becomes raised. They pay the one for it to be raised. And unless the runner can break that ice, then the run is over and this card is secure. Keeping in mind also that the ability on this card was to add two strength to the other ice that was encountered. So this ice, which was previously a strength of zero, would have a strength of two. Now I'm sure you're really keen to learn about what all this strength is and how the runner achieves uh, the, the breaking of this ice. So I think it's pretty much time to flip the table around.